Hello, I'm uh, Matt Brewster, and uh, today I'm going to demonstrate what I've brought today. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, CD32 that uh, also is equipped with the uh, MPEG module, which I'm playing a uh, movie right now with uh, Star Trek uh, Discovery Country. Um, this one is, uh, there's two kinds of uh, discs. This, this one will play both uh, types of video CDs. There was a CDI encoded one that CDI had put out to try to keep people out uh, from playing the, uh, those movies in their regular video CD players. They encoded so it would only play on the CDI. Um, this one will actually play both regular video CDs and the CDI um, uh, uh, recorded ones. So this one is a CDI recorded one, and then I also have a secret in one uh, back here with the just regular video CD. Anywhere that has a video CD. Um, one of the things I've added for this, because keyboards are so hard to find, I found this, I believe it's called the Lyra 2. Uh, it's a PC to Omega keyboard translator. Because uh, I only have one 84,000 keyboard at home, which I use on my desktop. And, uh, so I have a couple CD32s and other equipment that use this mini port. So I bought one of those and it works really great with a regular PS2 style keyboard. And the resetting and everything works with the control of Amiga and Amiga. You just have to use the Windows key instead. Um, this thing has uh, been running really great this, all this time. It's kind of amazing that this thing still works after amount of years that I've used it. Uh, so moving on, let me show you the next thing that I brought. Um, I brought my original mini MIG, which some of this so you can see it, um, with the black case that someone had, I forget the guy, gentleman's name, that printed these out and made this on this 3D printer somewhere. Um, this thing's really one of the, uh, a fun little box because it, it'll do all your A500 stuff. It also can load, um, which is really nice, you can load the Action Replay ROM version 3. So at any time it's like having an A500 with the Action Replay attached. So you can interrupt the machine and do all of your uh, normal Action Replay stuff where you can scan for modules and all the music, sound samples, save the program, scan memory for the images and things like that. And then also it has a, you know, the regular Action Replay stuff where you can scan for changes so you can find where the, uh, how many lives and stuff and make modifications in RAM. So, so that's a lot of fun. I got Ultimate Body Blows running on there. It was one of the fighting games that had come out from the Amiga. I also have it for the CD32, the CD version. Uh, and this one is just a floppy ADF version. Um, this one I believe will also do, um, I think it does the HDFs. So you can load the uh, hard drive image and boot up to a workbench. And all that have games pre-installed if you want. Um, okay, and then the next thing is I brought uh, my Raspberry Pi, which this is the newest version with the four cores. Um, this one's uh, pretty quick. Um, these are really nice because they're really small and tiny and you can run an um, uh, emulation station on there. I use the um, RetroPy. Uh, distribution that you can search on Google and search for RetroPie. You get the uh, image for it and you just uh, write it with Win32 Imager right to an SD card. And then you plug it in here and it'll come up with all your default, um, all the default emulators, which this thing's pretty packed. It's got the Amiga C64, um, there's other ones like the Sinclair. Obviously, uh, Super Nintendo and Scum VM, if you have any of those games, which is the uh, uh, various ones made by LucasArts, I believe, it was one of the ones that came out, like uh, Secret of Monkey Island was one, um, and that'll run over here directly. So it, they have a compiled version of the engine, so you just need the graphic files and all the stuff you just copy over. And that's done, including all the Amiga ADFs and any uh, uh, hard drive files, you know, if you have an HDF file. Um, also for the C64 emulator, you can load all your D64 images and all that. You do that over the network. So this thing has wireless and it's got a network port on the back. And when this thing's plugged into the network, it mounts uh, 
in your network neighborhood on the PC, you'll see Raspberry Pi. And then you'll see folders for all the emulators. And you dump all the uh, images in there, and it'll transfer over the network right to the machine. So you can have this in your living room um, on wireless, and you can load games wirelessly from one room to the other, and just start loading it with ROMs and disk images and, and all that stuff, and just go to your living room and just start playing with it. Um, so that's a really, really fun little tool. It's uh, got all the modern interfaces. It's got, uh, it's got the HDMI, which uh, hooks up to all the modern TVs. But it also has this little um, AV port that's right next to it. Um, there's a, a product from Microsoft called the Zoom that kind of came and went, but you can still find the cables. Because um, some of the three-prong cables for the composite uh, are, um, they're wired differently for each, so there's like a couple variations and you have to find the right one that's connected to the right red, green, and blue, otherwise the cable won't work. Uh, this one uses the same one as the Zoom, so you can find those pretty cheaply if they're on uh, Amazon. For uh, as one of the places you might find them on eBay as well, and that will give you your standard composite and your left and right audio. And what it does is it'll take the HD signal and it scales it down to NTSC, so it's still in the same HD res, but it just takes it down to standard depth. So you don't have to do any, there's no weird scaling or any, or any uh, where it has to run one NTSC and one HD, it'll do, it'll just take the HD and scales it down to NTSC and spits it out. So that's this, uh, this system. So now I'll move on to the next thing I brought. Um, back here, kind of hidden away, you'll see this little Gigabyte Bricks, which is just an i7. Uh, computer, it's pretty tiny, it's a four core i7, but it came with a, uh, a desktop GPU, so it's a mobile i7, but with a desktop uh, NVIDIA, I think it's 760 GPU. And then I use it because it's nice and tiny, I can take it with me to show it, and I can load Amiga Forever, which uh, since it's a four core i7, it runs, it runs really well under this. And when you have the Picasso mode, you obviously can get the full an HD Amiga desktop, and including running uh, personal paint, you can run it in HD resolution. Um, know that, and it's like really snappy. So, and obviously it does all the um, different color palettes, so you can do up to 256 for personal paint, which is just limited to 256, it's something that Hopefully at some point someone's going to update that a little further and be able to open up something larger than 256 color screen. But I think it's the way they, they map the colors that they just go up to. Uh, but it does a great job if you ever have to convert an image to uh, less uh, color depth. This program actually works really great at doing that if you have to load like a 24-bit image and you want to convert it to either 256 or if you need to convert it to 64 colors or even uh, uh, 16 colors or 16 colors yeah that's, that's <laughs> all the normal stuff even four colors that's cool. that too. yeah so it does a great conversion there's a, a dithering pattern option oh, on dithering. here that works uh, really good like here's dithering use uh, this Floyd, uh, Floyd Steinberg this thing does a really great job of converting 24-bit to even 256, that even I have trouble telling. You turn that point of Steinberg dithering on, you learn in HD, it's, you really have to look at it to really tell the difference because the engine's really, really good in that. Um, and it's fun to paint H, in an HD resolution because on the Amiga we had the little 320s by 240 and, or 200 and uh, all the way up to 640 by 400 and all that. Which, when you load it even higher, it's, it's great. <laughs> really fun stuff. Um, and then moving on from that over to, this is my uh, MIST board down here. Um, this is the newer ST version that has the two MIDI on the side for the Atari ST. Um, there's also a, another thing you can add here is the uh, Ethernet. There's a, a D-Link, I think it's D100, little USB Ethernet adapter, and that works on the ST core, and you can get an Atari ST on the internet. 
I'm hoping that at some point someone's going to get the Amiga core onto the internet. This thing would be really cool if I can get that on the, on the or even maybe even the C64 who <laughs> knows. Um, this will load different cores. Um, this is an FPGA, so it's a field programmable gate array. So this will, um, you load different cores and it'll flash the chip to be that system. So it'll run um, all the uh, software directly like it's on hardware. So it's a little different than a software emulator that's got to be translated from one CPU type to another. This will actually flash a regular, uh, was it 6502 in the C64? It'll actually flash that processor in there and it'll run the code directory directly with all the op codes and all that stuff. So a lot of stuff runs really well. The games run really smooth, just like on a real C64. So it's like really a, 60, a C64 clone or compatible this type of system versus an emulator, which is more of a translation and it's heavy on the CPU to make the translation on it. Even though the C64 is pretty easy to emulate. This works a little better because it's closer to the hardware side of it. So if you can't find the C64 or you want something a little smaller, um, this works pretty good. Um, this one outputs VGA um, at 31 kilohertz. So if you have a TV or something, you've got to check to make sure you still have the VGA port. Because some, a lot of HDTVs have been now starting to eliminate that port and just going straight HDMI. So if that happens, there's this adapter you can get, which I have it in the box in the other can, I'll show it at the end of the video. That'll take the um, VGA and the audio, and it'll convert it into an HDMI signal. So if you have a TV that lacks it, that little adapter works. And that's uh, available, I think, on Amazon. It's a little thing. It's powered by USB. It's just a little box. Um, the other thing you have to check for is, because this thing will do um, NTSC and PAL, that a lot of TVs uh, will reject the PAL signal. If you, like it'll, it'll accept the NTSC regular uh, standard uh, 60 hertz US signal, but as soon as you switch into PAL, it'll say lost signal. So you gotta check your TV, make sure it'll be. That's only one of the quirky things. You gotta make sure that you have a monitor that'll do both, because a lot of uh, Amiga stuff, the games are in PAL. So, a lot of times you wanted that kind of versatility to be able to switch between the two. Um, there's also some other cores on here. There's, I guess, the Big 20 uh, is available. And uh, the, of course, other stuff, Atari ST. Um, there's a Nintendo uh, emulator, uh, uh, Nintendo core that came out for this that runs really well, just to show the, the versatility of it. You know, it's another, because they have the 6502, the same as the C64s in the, in the regular 8-bit Nintendo, so, so it's kind of, e it's been easy to kind of translate over. Um, they also translate a few arcade cores, uh, Pac-Man, uh, Galaga, and uh, there's a few others, I don't remember the names, <laughs> but um, those run really well. Um, like, it does a really great job of the, um, running the arcade stuff, like the Galaga, it, the monitor was sideways. They mounted that in the case in the arcade, and it's the same way on here. It will load the actual core, and the image will be sideways. So, on mine, I, I found this special monitor that does the, the tilt. So when I load Galaga, I can tilt the monitor just like the arcade, and do the insert quarter and all that stuff on the keyboard. Um, so I get the real identical experience. Um, but I have a lot of fun with this uh, system. It runs. It runs really well, runs the software really well with this DVD SD card and just put that on, plug that in the PC. It's just a regular FAT32 formatted SD card, so you put all your cores on there. And you just dump, download it off the internet on your PC and dump it over to the SD card with the SD card reader. Um, same way with all the D64 images and ADFs, and uh, this will also do HDF files. Um, in the Mega mode, since uh, I mean, you can have more RAM and stuff. Let me load that core up real quick. Show that to you real fast. Got a lot of cores on here. We have Atari, Clickbook Vision, uh, C16. This thing has an 18 bit decoder, so it's not quite full 24 bit. But what they've done is some sort of translation 
translate uh, the 24-bit Amiga 1200 and Amiga 4000 AGA stuff to 18-bit, so it'll run on here. It'll do the hammy modes and all that. Um, so there's a slight color reduction. Um, not quite 24-bit, but I haven't really noticed it's so close that it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. Um, one of the nice things about the MIS board is since it has more memory, if the full two makes of uh, three bytes of chip, and then of course you have um, some fast RAM. So this one has another about it, it's a 20, 24 megabytes of uh, fast RAM. So you can run um, a lot more regular AGA programs like an A4000 type setup or an expanded A1200. Um, this will do HDF, so this is actually installed uh, like a hard drive. So I've got this thing here. I set up more pressure and work. Um, I create those files. I use Amiga Forever to create the hard drive files and all that. And then I come in here and I just load the um, install floppies uh, in ADF format, which is available on Amiga Forever. You'll find the full 3.1 install set in ADF format on the on those discs, so I use those to get my standard 3.1 installation. And then, of course, you can load different ROMs, of course. This will go, uh, you know, 3.1, you can load 1.3 ROM, and you can, you, can that. you can change all that in the, in the menu. You can say different use. Like, I can load uh, a version 1.2 if I wanted to, or 2.4. I just went with the uh, latest uh, 3.1 for the expanded system, and then I also have an A500 configuration that will load it in OCS and 1.3, and it'll load all my uh, older games from the Amiga 500, which I have a lot of. A lot of those games are really excellent. I love Out of This World. And, uh, Shadow of the Beast was uh, was a fun game, really difficult. <laughs> I can't play it all the time, but it's, it's so hard. Um, there is a cheap thing on that you can find that uh, keep, allows you to keep all the energy play through it. Um, if you love to cheat, it's a lot of fun. You can see all the levels I can never get to on my own. Um, so going back to the uh, 3.1 core, or the 3.1 OS with uh, the AGA core, um, with various software loaded, like uh, I put Disney Animation Studio on here, which is a lot of fun. Uh, I have a niece and nephew, and I've loaded this up, and I've been able to, I love the default animations, stuff I show them, and then they like to paint on this and, and do a few things with it, which is a lot of fun. Um, let me load something more quick to show you. So that'll play back the you know, standard animations. And really great. You have a lot of fun. You know, kids find this really interesting because they don't make software like that anymore. There isn't software you can just buy for your PC and just start drawing things and animating. <laughs> that doesn't seem to uh, it's kind of faded away. Because just using a lot of times computers just to surf the internet and do other things. A lot of the creative tools are still still on the uh, on our systems. They haven't quite haven't quite been replaced. Um, so of course this does, does it's the standard uh, keyboard shortcut plug this one. You know the onion skinning and all that so this is a pretty different solo standard. So you can go back and forth and see where you were. So it's kind of fun. I show the kids how to make a ball bounce across the screen and squash, which is one of the demos they used to show back in the day. You see a lot of videos on YouTube of that when they demonstrated the software. Um, I'll run says info in case you're curious about the speed of the core uh, and the configuration. So this one's configured as an O20. You can see it registers as the AGA um, with the two megs of RAM. And I believe there's the memory mapping. I'll show you that. So there's three sets of memory that it's been loaded with. They do it in three parts. So there's the 
as the uh, chip round and then the fast, some fast rumoring and then they fix. I guess it's set up as a Zorro card on the Zorro side. I'm not probably sure I have to verify that. Uh, so you can have an additional, additional memory. That's why it's at 24, because I think it's like a 16 and then an 8 and then uh, the 2 megs of the chip. I think that's how it's set up. Um, I'll do a speed thing real quick soon. At least look at how fast that thing can run. Um, so you can see I'm um, like 5.6 times faster. Stop, stop uh, 1,200 at 1,400 uh, megahertz. So it's got a little bit of speed, not quite. A um, little better than the A3000 with the 30 at 25 megahertz. It's about 1.47, so it's about 1 and a half times. Not quite the O40, but, and not quite the Vampire bar Board, which smokes. Uh, pretty much everything out there. Uh, this does run pretty well though, uh, as an expanded Amiga uh, configuration. So, uh, I think that's, uh, I can show you the loading different configurations because I can show you how it can change. I should have saved it. So on this one, since, oh, I don't know what's going on. I may have crashed it. <laughs> oh no, there it is. It, it, it's in there. So, so right there, I was able to change the because um, I saved the setting because I hate chip going in and saying select different ROM, uh, change the chip set. All you can save up to four settings. There's a, uh, or five, I should say. There's a default, the one you always want when you turn it on, and then there's uh, up to four different set settings, uh, which can have different configurations. So you can have your 1.3 and your 3.1 and just switch it on the menu and it'll, it'll change. Matt, what other cores does it have? Does it have a Commodore PET core? Um, I, don't think it has a, I don't think it has a PET core yet. Does it have a plus but, four core? Uh, let, me, let me check, because I did uh, load a bunch of new cores recently. It's hard to keep track of this because there's like a dozen cores. It's hard to <laughs> keep track of which ones are updated. I'm always on GitHub checking to see what's been updated because they got a history uh, of all the updates and I always check to see what the newest thing is. And I usually get that one. Uh, this one, uh, see I got the VIC-20. I'll just kind of go through all those homework. So there's the Big 20. I, I never had a Big 20 back in the day, so I did, I'm not as familiar with it with some of the games that they have for it. But Robert is more familiar with it. He can tell me the different things. It has the Big 20 with expanded memory there, 32K memory. You can change the memory down to. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah without the uh, expansion memory. Yeah. And then on this one, I turn uh, the scan lines on. A lot of the cores have that, depending on your monitor. It without scan I like it with scan lines because it, it looks more like the original. You know, because without the scan lines, it, it makes it look more blocky. And it's like, that's not the way it looked. <laughs> so I, I usually I'm on the course, so it's not the media part of scans, but they allow you to turn it off because on some monitors, like this one, it's close, but it's not quite. So there's a little bit, but scan lines aren't perfect. There's the scaling that like, happens in this particular monitor. Um, and this monitor works good. It'll do both signals in the uh, NTSC and PAL. It's really nice. That's what that is an NEC monitor? Yes, it says uh, NEC multi uh, what was it? 1880SX. Hmm. Um, okay. It says multi sync, and I was hoping, oh, maybe it'll do 15 kilohertz. It, don't, it doesn't do 15 kilohertz, which is the only thing that I'm like, kind of bummed about. I want to plug my 1200 into this thing, you know, and actually have a flat panel. But it, It'll work at the higher scan rates, but not the 15 kilohertz. You, you get no signal. And of course, this has um, this has BJ. This has uh, DVI ports too, which uh, I could probably plug my uh, mist board into it. And some of my other you know devices that had that output. Like I wanted to try it on the uh, A600 Vampire board, which I just got a hold of, and my A600 is giving me problems. And so unfortunately, I wasn't able to demonstrate it today. That was one of the things I wanted to. But wasn't able to uh, get that to work. It was kind of a 
a last minute uh, discovery that my A600 that was working great all this time suddenly didn't want to power on and I found out it's not the power supply, which makes it more complicated. But going back to this, um, you can load the, the PRG files which will load directly in the memory. The C64 core does that too. So if you load that, it will write in the memory and you just type in run. So uh, instead of having the, you know, like the floppy drive, because it does do the, the you know, um, D64 images, uh, but it has to load and go through that whole process and kind of fake the machine into thinking it's communicating with the disk drive, but it's actually not. So it has to pace it so the C64 core and, and the other cores can uh, when you see a disk. But this one doesn't do this particular uh, Big 20 core doesn't do the uh, disk images, but it does the PRG and CRG. So, which the PRG, I kind of prefer that. And it just loads instantly. Right. I hate, I hate waiting a bit. Back in the day, loading the game, like, well, I'll go do something else for a few minutes and come back on some of those games. It took forever to load on the back in the day. So let me load another core. Let's see what else I have left. Oh, what was that? Plus two. <laughs> no, oh, yes, this four. is in a. Uh, Plus two is the original Macintosh oh, okay. emulator that came out. Um, it's a little uh, flimsy right now. It's, it, it works, but it breaks easily. Okay. But it'll load a black and white, you know, was it 512 by 384 screen, classic black and white Macintosh running System 6. Um, has a hard, it'll read hard drive images and uh, floppy images. Uh, I'm still messing with that because I was never quite a fan of the original Macintosh as much as I was of the Amiga and the C64. That's why I had the Amiga C64 because I liked it better. <laughs> but the Mac isn't too bad. It's kind of fun. And, uh, I was going to try to get Dark Castle to work in there for some people who played that back in the day. There's a version of Dark Castle or the original Mac that people seem to be fond of. Um, even though there, I think there's a C64 version. I think there's an Amiga version. I know there's an Amiga version. But uh, I think there was a C64 version. that a lot of times the cores allow you to change stuff. Like even the Amiga core, you can change the chipset while it's running, so, so which confuses the Amiga, like it's running in AGA mode, and suddenly you switch it to OCS, and the software's all, what the hell just happened? So this <laughs> the is, software gets confused, because it's a they, really they strange instance that never happens in the real world. They don't call it a plus four core, it's called a C16 core. But yeah. It has, it has 64 k So is this, is this the... Yeah, that's, plus, a, okay. that's a plus four, but uh, can you change the amount of memory down to to the C16 memory unit or no? I don't know. Because I just see the C16K. Oh, okay. C16K will do it. Okay, that's have to see the Let me do what it says. Because it's, it's running live, so it's, it's so, kind of confused. It's like a, yeah, maybe that may not be one there. Or I have to look for Sometimes it doesn't clear memory, right? Yeah. And you switch the settings. Because so I've noticed sometimes I'll load one core and I'll load another core, and there's some leftovers from the other core. And it uses uh, the next core because it doesn't clear memory. You know, write zeros to it, so it's not there. So sometimes there's leftover, <laughs> leftover stuff. So that you just have to pay attention to that. Like sometimes you load certain things and then load something else. Yeah, I'll wait for that. Keep going, man. I'll keep going. Yeah. Keep going, except now. <laughs> and then this one does, uh, this one's a program that does PRG. 
64 images. Apparently, the, uh, when you do the uh, floppy images, it's a little more complicated because it has to emulate the, the drive. So it emulates, the, like, like it's connected to the drive and communicating with it, it simulates that to, you know, sends out all the track information that we collect. So it's a little more, a little more involved than just loading a PRG because that you just load something right in memory, write it to it, so it's a less overhead for the for the cores to do. So you'll see that a lot of times. The, this load PRG will get implemented first before the disk images. Let's see. So what other cores? Yeah, well, you can change the input device too. Sometimes you can flip the joystick connections. Uh, oh, and let me talk about the, the controllers real quick. This has the two standard uh, nine pin connectors on the side. Okay. As you can see, and I've got uh, I hit the reset by accident. Um, it has the regular regular controller ports for the uh, standard Amiga controllers and C64 controllers. Uh, Sega Genesis controllers, I believe, will work through there, just like it did on the original Amiga. Um, a lot of the cores will route, though, um, the controller can be routed to a USB controller. So you can buy a, a USB controller. This one I got a NES replica because it's nice and small. <laughs> nice and small controller. Um, that's plugged into this. And it'll route the controller port to there and you can swap it inside uh, a lot of times in the core. Like if it's supposed to be connected to port one or port two, you can just change it here instead of having it come. Because it's USB, so <laughs> there's a, a lot of devices that get plugged in. So you can swap it there. I mean, the the and the media down here. Which on this you still do on some of the cores. It doesn't have that swapping feature, so sometimes you have to unplug it and change it like oh, it's on the other port. But they're still working on that. The cores get updated all the time. So, um, of course, they will do other other systems. Uh, like here's the Atari 2600, there's the Amstrad, um, the Apple II, um, something called the Aquarius. I don't even know that is exactly, I need to do a little more research on that. Uh, Atari 5200, Atari 800, or NTSC, and Atari 800 is how, uh, the BBC Micro, and uh, there's 16 again. Uh, ColecoVision is on here. Um, some of these uh, are repeated cores, like very different revisions that I've done learning. So some of these cores I might have a few, like I have three MDG cores on here. Uh, versions of it, but I need to just delete the older ones. I just haven't had a chance to do that. Um, there's a C64 with the uh, added floppy drive emulation. And then this is an early Sega Genesis emulator. Um, Turbo Graphics 16, reference to. Um, this is the arcade Galaga, same one that's in the arcade where you have to insert quarters. And, uh, on that, that's where the monitor sideways is. Luckily, I have this monitor that turns sideways. So I, can load, I can load that arcade core in there and actually play it like it was back in the day. Um, the Galax and there's another arcade for, uh, Game Boy. There's no side. Here's the arcade space invader. Um, this is the menu core, which is what you're sitting here. They developed the menu core so you can, when you turn it on, you can go right to a menu with all the cores. Um, you could also set it up to go right, go into, uh, go right into a C64 core or a new core right when you turn it on. Um, you do have to have one default core to do that, otherwise it won't boot up. So there's a, as long as one of the files is uh, called core, it'll load that. So just take uh, like the Amiga core and make, uh, make a copy. I usually make a copy of it in the core if you want the default to be the Amiga. Or you can have, uh, do it with a C64 core or you do it with one of the arcade cores if you want. Most cores have a menu. Some only go right into the system and there's no way to get back to the menu to change it. So make sure you have a core that has a menu. So it's the default. Most do. There's a few that haven't got the menu implemented yet. Um, so some of the other cores. Uh, these are the uh, media cores called Mini Mag. This is after the Mini Mag, which is the first FPGA thing that was an experiment, so we're using that code, so it still has that, that name. Uh, 
Uh, there's Moon Patrol. Uh, there's a Nintendo, original Nintendo uh, uh, core, which can run your Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> and all the other Nintendo games. The compatibility uh, is actually pretty good for that core. Um, the controller needs to be worked on a little bit. Sometimes it drops the connection, so sometimes we'll be doing something to Mario and he'll, he'll, he won't stay ducked, he'll just suddenly stand up. And just sort of just, uh, don't get that sense. But, you know, since I'm, I do, I play a lot of the classic games too, and I can tell if something's not quite implemented right, I'll instantly know. Um, after that, I forget which one this one. Oh, MSX. The MSX device, which uh, I need to get a little more familiar with that one. There's a lot of computer cores on here that I never got a chance to play with, which, which is fun. I get a lot of exposure to different uh, different gaming systems, different computer systems that I may not have access to. That now I have access to it. Uh, there's a Pac-Man arcade core uh, in Pengo, which is another arcade. So. Um, the Plus 2, which I talked about earlier, is the original Macintosh of the System 6, the virtual hard drive, virtual copy, so you can play some of the original, a lot of original black and white games, and they will uh, load it on a higher resolution uh, screen, even though it's still like 512 by 384, it like moves it up to 1024 by 768, I believe, even though it's still, the graphics are still in that movie. So at least the monitor will sync to it. Um, I forgot which the what this one was. Um, I to find out, but here's the Sam Koof, which is another system I'm not familiar with. I think it was sold in Europe. It's that Sam machine. Not as familiar with. It's one of the things I'm experimenting with. I find out what that system was like and try to in the games so like to see what what those systems do and uh, how some of the games play because they have different people. Every system had their favorites, uh, favorite games that were really well written and everything. We had those systems, you know, know about that. So you have to do a search on the internet to find out a little more of the history and then track it down and then find the disk in the system and try it out and just kind of experience it for yourself. Um, this is the Sega Master System, which is a system before the Genesis. Uh, it's a little Z80 processor, it's an 8-bit generation, kind of the counterpart, counterpart to the Nintendo Entertainment System that was brought by Sega. Um, and the next one is a Spectrum simulator, or uh, say it's a FPJ port, it's not actually I keep using that terminology, it's technically not a right? um, so, so there's the Big 20 that we did earlier, uh, something called Video Pack, which uh, another system I want to get familiar with. I don't know on here. I don't, don't know exactly what it does. <laughs> and the, what's capable of doing. Um, another uh, CX Spectrum. There's a thing called X called the Zeti. I think that's what this will be. And I think that's all the questions are for here. I can show you other... Um, let me show you on the um, C64 core real quick. Because I was talking about how you can send these disk images and load PIGs that load instantly. I'll show you that. Because that's actually a lot of fun. Because it's a lot quicker. Because back in the days, the floppy drives were so slow. <laughs> You'd have to wait like two minutes. You know, to load a game sometimes. And like, I really want to play this game. <laughs> I had to wait two minutes. <laughs> you know, and it's, when, when I was a kid, you were impatient. When you had to play the game, so you know, get spoiled like with a Nintendo. You just turn it on because it's ROM based. But they had a lot of good games, so it was always worth the wait. So, I don't know what a PRG is. I've got different ones like on here. So now I've loaded it into memory and I just hit run. To bring it up. It's on one of these controllers. Swap the controller ports so that you don't have to swap it here physically because in the day sometimes they want the other port and you can swap it. It's a little easier here. 
It sounds like exactly the same model, so it's pretty much like a clone of the shit. Um, and obviously you can have other things, like some people have the like, dual SID, they load it into the... Uh, um, some people, you know, have uh, the dual SIDs, you can stay in SID, and hopefully at some point they'll add that in here. Let's add a flash number SID in there. Stereo SID, hopefully they'll add that as an option. Um, and then of course, uh, to get all this stuff is on GitHub, it's all open source. So if you search on uh, Google and look for the GitHub project for the MIST board, and you'll find all the code and all the updates, and uh, on a little forum with the, where you can download the cores, and they, they talk about what they've changed and what they've added, and it's got the number of days that have passed since they've updated it. So a lot of times I go on there and see what's, what's changed. A lot of times I'm on there and I, can get, uh, I check what's a day just to see What's what's changed? Um, so every every uh, few days or so, there's usually a change. Or somebody requesting the future. Or some sort of thing. So, um, is there anything anyone really wants to particularly see, or uh, is there a Vectrix core plan for the machine? I haven't heard anything for the Vectrix, but you should request it. Oh, I, I, what do I request? <laughs> <laughs> on GitHub. Oh, on GitHub. Is anyone working on? <laughs> you know, because a lot of people are saying it's all open source, it's like obvious and stuff. And so, um, FPJs are a little sometimes difficult to uh, program. There's two languages they use, and <laughs> it looks kind of like C, but it's, you're flashing hardware, mm -hmm. so you have to you're setting up signals on the pins and all that. And, uh, Things internally in the core, so I'm still trying to figure that out how to how to do that myself because I wouldn't know I'm <laughs> contributing to some of these cores. It's a real fascinating thing to me. The uh, field of animal gatorades that are in these machines. Any questions from anybody about uh, any of his machines here on the table? <laughs> the Raspberry Pi, the list. The little mini PC there, or the Amiga CD32? Yeah, running movies. I know you guys just got here. Yeah, it's back in the day. Uh, before DVD, there was video CD, which is the first attempt to put uh, movies on compact disc. And uh, that came out in 92 or 93, and that time it was still going to CDI was a big pusher that the from Phillips, a big competitor. <coughs> They got it in Paramount, so there's a lot of Paramount movies that were uh, put on uh, video CD. Uh, one of the units that was able to play video CDs was the UC32, but it's an optional card that you had to buy. And ever since this thing was out for six months when we went out of business, and not all of the video cartridges got distributed, so I think there's like 50,000 in the world floating around before they all made it. So I know that the software had at one point had that. Uh, Gotten stock a few years later, they had found them somewhere in the Philippines. Stock room somewhere, because they couldn't ship them here, they were stored somewhere, so they were able to get a hold, somehow get a hold of the stuff. So I bought a second one, so I put two of these MP models and two CD32s. So as a backup to one of these one, dies here. Um, this will also play the CDI Fusion Play games with the uh, Formats because they wanted the 471 to play their movies only on their system. So they would uh, encode them as a CDI movie, a CDI disc, and uh, it locked out all the DVD players or uh, all the video C other video CD players at the time. Uh, like DVD players will have backward compatible with video CD. The lot of those are locked out because they're formatted differently. Um, there were a lot of complaints about that. Phillips eventually just started doing the regular video CDs. Like this is a regular formatted video CD, and this one's the CDI. The CD32 
Marvel playbook because they had modified the, the ROM. They added the code to be able to play the CDI one. So it's really yeah. cool. like all the other ones that they had. But Sega Saturn with the uh, video CD add-on. I don't think it plays the same content. I have to check, but most of these were locked, locked out and only playable on CDI. So, but the CD32 will play both. Which is highly convenient in uh, the time. I was able to go to Blockbuster Video and they had a whole video CD section, so I was able to grab movies at the time. It was like, oh, instead of the VHS, just walk right past the VHS and get my video CD. Strange with digital video puns. So that we What year is that? Uh, this came out at the end of 93, I believe. 93, end of 93. Yeah, it was, and, and it was uh, not released in the US officially uh, because there was an injunction. Some company was trying to sue them over some little XR patent. They were doing that whole patent mining thing where they'd get a patent. The shoe company to get money out of them. And uh, Commodore got hit with that, and they got an injunction that blocked the CD32 from being imported into the US. They could sell it in Europe, and luckily they could sell it in Canada. So a lot of the units went to Canada and they filtered through into the United States, which is what this unit was. I had to order this from Canada back then, originally. And I had it shipped down to my house in, the, in California. Uh, which they were happy about. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Commodore went out of business soon after, it was like six months later, so they never officially launched it in the US. But it's one of the early 32 bit game consoles. It's based on the I think there was only one Japanese game that was in Japan, so it's based on the 386. Technically, 32 bits. Uh, they say this is the first. Uh, a lot of times, we'll say the first, well, the first 32 bit game console that there's some dispute. There's a one in Japan, that one unit that they have shipped out. So the that's technically the first one to beat it. This also beat out the 3DO, which was a little bit longer. 3 I think was a little more powerful. But they were all uh, also X and Mega people. If you ever look at three, you know, the design is very similar. The chipset is very similar to the chipset. It's the same people. Three years ago, I don't know if you like that one. Hello. Yeah, so that's. Uh, are you still recording? Because uh, yeah. I'm kind of repeating part of it for the yeah. people that came in. You're over there. And like, I, I don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, on, uh, the next thing that I have is a, uh, a mini book, and this is like the first FPGA project that they've done. It's hard to um, it runs the runs to Amiga 500. The guy started out as an experiment to see if he could do it. And he was successful and was able to simulate the Amiga 500 in the FPGA. And he acquired a of it called the Amiga. And so that was one of the first ones, and everybody's like, oh, we can do this, and then everybody else started doing it like that. So when did that come out? Uh, this one, I'm heading on to, what would you say, Roger? Was it like 2007? Or For the... 2005, 2007, the video game. Because that was the first was one. 2011? 2011, okay. Maybe or so, maybe no, a little bit later than that. Okay, yeah. go ahead and turn it access. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to check. I, 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 immediately, really fast. I immediately bought it though. As soon as it was available, I'm like, I want one of those. So I got one. And then I found the case because it didn't come with a case. And someone was making the cases separately. Mm -hmm. So I had to pay a lot for the, the case too. So the case cost the, I forgot, it maybe as much as the, uh, uh -huh. the unit itself. So, But I liked the, the black. They said a black one in the room, so I got the black one. So he did a really nice job. It's really nice. So this one does an A500 and um, doesn't have a lot of memory. It has a real 68,000 though, so it doesn't have to, like that one has to flash 68,000. This one, they put a real one in there. So um, it's slightly different, it's like a 16 megahertz 68,000, so they play with the clock, to, I think they play with the clock to have a real one. Uh, but you can actually overclock it. There's a thing in here where you can tell it to go, uh, to boost it up. And it, 
benchmark's gone to A3000. How do you do that? But it only has like two megabytes of RAM, so that's a chipset and stuff. But you can at least boost the CPU speed up. 2005. Oh, 2005. 2005. Yeah. So that's really nice. And you have like, I suppose you can access the external hard drives, or is it all SD or? This one, this one, I think it does HDS after it works. I think it just have a couple of these. <laughs> In the different competitors, but uh, this one will do the flop. I know, yeah, it does do the hard drive, mm -hmm. which I have the, uh, I do have the seven ton here. Uh, but I, I have to look, look, I have to set it up again. Uh, this one has, uh, I have the action replay ROM button in it too, too, so. Because I have that sidecar from the 500, mm -hmm. uh, so that you could uh, freeze the game and do all your cheats and all that. Uh, this one will load the, Action Replay 3 ROM, which is a specific version that it works for, which I like to load that on there, because I can, I can stop the machine at any time. It's just like on a real uh, A500 with Action Replay. Like, you know, um, do all, the, all that fun stuff. So. Um, this thing only has, like, I think it's 2 megabytes of RAM. So, but you can split it up, I think, uh, the configuration can change the, change the amount of memory. Like, right now, I'm set up 1 meg to have like, uh, Three stuff, so I can start working through the other games as well. 1.3 base, so. Um, and we'll load the, the other ROM, so I can do it 3.1 on with the hard drive and all that. And I did have that set up and then I didn't save the setting, so I'd have to set it up and then do it. I did to it up and to see if it Set that up. Um, but you can just load different textures. I got different ones on there. Load, uh, There's the 1.3. Load other versions. Oh, and on this one, since it uh, doesn't have enough 20, it's a 68,000. Uh, if you load the 3.1 ROM, there are two variations. There's one compiled for the 20, and one compiled for the 68,000. There's a slight difference. Um, so you have to buy uh, the 3.0, or you have to find the uh, 3.1 image from uh, a computer that has a RAID of 68,000, and it like uh, the one for the A500 to A2000 image, as opposed to the Amiga 1200 version. The Amiga 1200 version, is more, I, know, I, if I remember correctly, won't run on this, because it requires about 20, and it's only a 68,000, so there's some things that it won't, it won't kick over. But the, the A500 version will, because it has 68,000, so they assume that maybe you don't have an accelerator, so you'll be able to upgrade the ROM. I could load the, uh, let's see if I can load the hard drive real quick. on the uh, A600 IDE controller, which is uh, in the FPGA side. It looks like the, oh, I see, I just had it disabled. But I have the controller. You save the configuration, so we don't have to do that again. You reset it with that configuration, and it should load. It should load the hard drive image. Of course, it has two lights in the front seat. So of course, in the machine mode back in the day, it was always a black screen. So. Yeah. Maybe the hard drive is just more. Don't do white screen. 
Oh, no, I'm a trap. I didn't know. No, it's just wasted. And this one uses a PS2 style keyboard and mouse, so you just have to find a PS2 round keyboard and style mouse and keyboard. See, it has a final set of the bottom. Okay, boost it up. I need to change that. You can save the configurations. Uh, so you have like, different slots. There's uh, five slots that we use the defaults, and one when you first turn on. And then you got another four slots, and you can have it set up with uh, 3.1 with the hard drive, and then go back to 1.3 with the, there's nothing that you still have to load the games. So. I don't quite remember what I put on here. But I do have some control. Oh, that's good. An older version of Sism You can see it registers as an ECS to make the diagnosis. And it says uh, at the moment on standard speed 1.0, like an Amiga 500. So. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a uh, mode to, to make it load faster. Turbo speed is not the most. Oh, that's right. I have a, an add on in there, so I, I actually do have more memory. I forgot I had done that. It added a device in there. We placed the PIC controller with an ARM based controller, and it gave me more memory. It's been a while since <laughs> I set this thing up. I've been playing with uh, this board a lot more. There's more cores and more stuff out. And this thing's pretty much subtle um, in terms of the software. It's pretty much in the final stages and it's very compatible. So there's a lot of updates. It's a compatibility is really simple. Um, so is that the most compatible one out of the other boards? Yeah, I think this one's probably the. Because it's been out for so long, and there's been people working on it, you know, since 2005, is that what you said? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's had a long, long time. And is it still actively being developed? Yeah, because um, they're, they're developing it on the other ones, and then usually a lot of times they'll port it back, you know, they will port it back. So, but a lot of times it, it may take a while for someone to do that, because um, this one's been so reliable that it's really needed to change too much. Plus, there's a lot of extras. You know, like that one has more memory, and it's got an extra hardware, USB controller, and so you can add that. Ethernet, for example, I will work on that. The misboard, only on one of the cores. They haven't added it to everything. It works on the SD port. I'm still trying to mess with it to get that set up, so I'm not as familiar with the SD. I bought the uh, USB uh, to Ethernet dongle that it works with, but I haven't. Um, I'm not as familiar with the Atari ST, and so I haven't had it fully working yet, so. Well, this is why it looks cool, the thing the Mist. The Mist, the yeah. The combination of Amiga and the Atari ST, of course. Because the guy was a big Atari ST fan. Mm -hmm. This is the newest one, right? Yeah, this is the newest one. This has the, uh, this is the Atari ST version. It has the two mini ports on the side. So you can load uh, your old Atari uh, music software and drive all your MIDI equipment, just um, like you did originally. Uh, Matt, we have some drawings to do, so okay. if anybody else has further questions, I'll have to talk to you one-on-one -on -one personally. Okay. So thank you, Matt, for your presentation. All right, thank you. Thank you.